and I'm, I'm sure we are we are going to deliver on your trust uh, today. It's a really great pleasure to uh, to welcome Faris Koch and our colleague from Ljubljana uh, University uh, today uh, for his talk uh, about the warless uh, village of Balvine uh, in Bosnia uh, and Herzegovina. Uh, Faris, welcome. Uh, these are our uh, RECAS fellows, colleagues uh, we have spent together uh, some, some time uh, working on the, the topic, uh, which is towards a culture of shared future in Southeast Europe. So the, the topic you're covering is really very well uh, integrated uh, in the overall, the broader topic of the, the fellowship. And we have some other additional guests. I'm, I'm pleased to see uh, additional uh, colleagues uh, joining us uh, today. So Faris, is uh, assistant professor at chair of international relations uh, at the faculty of social sciences at the university of uh, ljubljana uh, faris is also a principal investigator uh, of the university of ljubljana in a major horizon europe project which is called reclaim uh, the project uh, the full name is reclaiming liberal democracy in europe in the post-factual age so faris is working with colleagues from, from multiple European uh, universities on basically disinformation, on the effects uh, of disinformation and advising uh, uh, on the actions to mitigate those uh, effects. Paris has been uh, working on several topics. Uh, his focus uh, really and his publications are uh, focusing around the securitization of identities in the context of European integration of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So his work today will also speak uh, of Bosnia and Herzegovina, although with, I would say with a, with a group of uh, colleagues, uh, Faris has been working on other uh, uh, contexts uh, in, the, in the former Yugoslavia or Southeast uh, Europe, if you wish. He has published uh, in, in several papers, in nationalities papers, in peace building, also in the Journal of International Relations and Development. This is the journal which recently published, Faris, your paper on Balvine that we are going to uh, talk about uh, today. Also, Faris published in Ethnopolitics uh, in Southeast Europe and Black Sea Studies. Uh, and uh, last year, uh, you were a contributor, uh, Faris, to, to a book which is called Trouble Past in Europe, Strategies and Recommendations for Overcoming Challenging Historic Legacies. So as I say, very much related to the topic of our fellowship, I'm very, very pleased and grateful to you for dedicating uh, the time uh, uh, to us today. And without further ado, uh, I'm, uh, the floor, Faris, is yours for your presentation, after which we will have time for, for questions and answers and hopefully a fruitful discussion. Over to you, Faris. Thank you so much, Valentino, for this really nice uh, presentation. And thank you all to all of you who are interested in the talks regarding uh, the village that, you know, um, managed to prevent war or the people in the village that managed to prevent, you know, open violence. So as Valentina said, my PhD and most of my publications are focused on ethnopolitics and antagonisms. And that's why Balvina is particular, you know, close to my heart because it's a village or, you know, a place in Bosnia and Herzegovina where people actually manage to, you know, stay people, as I like to say that, and manage to say, you know, good neighbors and manage to prevent large-scale violence. So that's why I intend to talk about uh, the peace and inter-ethnic relationships or what people make of it, the story of Balvin, a warless Bosnian and Herzegovinian um, mosaic of peace. So it was a part, as Valentino already said, a project. So the research project was called Anxieties in Cities of Southeast European Post-Conflict Societies, introducing an integrative approach to peace building. So peace building is really at my, my heart. And the previous three years, I was really dedicated to peace building. Um, I also managed now to apply ERC, and I'm going to get the complementary scheme also in that regard. So I'm going to stay in this Bosnia and Kosovo's path. And this project aimed at answering, so why inter-ethnic relations in some places in post-conflict societies of Southeast Europe do not exhibit a high distance, you know, contrary to the majority of places where we have the divided cities. So that was our, you know, macro puzzle. So we are mostly talking about places such as Mostar, uh, uh, Mitrovica, you know, which are per se divided. And why are we not talking about the places that are not divided or do not exhibit such you know, uh, 
ethnic distance as you know the majority of places are so we have a lot of let's say negative stories or stories that we have to unpack but we also have a lot of positive stories that are worth reflecting upon and highlighting upon and maybe those positive stories could also teach us something about the the nature or the dynamics of inter-ethnic relations right and then we tried to develop a model of for decreasing ethnic distance this was as Valentina already said part of um, social psychologists and other team members of the project but I was mostly focused on on Balvine right and you know when we tried to approach Balvine this was in 2021 or 2000 and early 2022 we started to ask you know scholars people's practitioners in Bosnia and Herzegovina hey have you heard of Balvine right so we had like two or three media articles on you know the village that managed to prevent the war but they said that they didn't heard of that Balvina is not covered academically that this is something that is not of interest also for the political elites you know um, that strive to you know build some bridges and build everlasting peace in that respect right and then of course we started with the presumptions that ethnic identities remain sore spots right of many post-conflict uh, societies not just in Kosovo for example where my colleague was intensively working on Kamenica which is quite similar case than in Balvina but it's more of a city not a village right and of course where ethnic identities remain sore spots is in Bosnia and Herzegovina right so where the, this instrumentalization of ethnicity became you know to a certain extent a part and parcel of this post uh, war everyday reality set in the Dayton peace agreement right so and when you try to from the perspective of scholarship try to challenge the understanding of the nature of these antagonisms you tend to reflect upon for example security or social and economic well-being governance and participation justice and reconciliation so you have many research niches or programs that tend to unpack the nature of antagonisms that exist right not just from the NGO perspective, but also from academic perspectives, right? And the core questions within, you know, peace building paradigm was always how to improve inter interethnic relations. So to a certain extent, I also tend to reflect that in academia, you also have some normative standards and these normative standards that you share also with other people trying to improve interethnic relationships through your work as well, right? So for example, when I said Mostar, you have, you know, this institutional discourse, uh, socially constructed spaces such as Srpska, divided cities of Mostar, right? So you have a lot of different uh, challenges or, you know, issues that you then we try to, to do it in uh, via structural factors. So we tended to think about, okay, so which factors can explain the nature of antagonism? So we tended to crystallize the political institutional factors, the socioeconomic factors, uh, spatial strategic factors, historical factors, which are, of course, important, probably one of the most important factors, as you know, the perception of people is very important, uh, cultural, right? And then we had the idea of a discourse, which, you know, functioned as a frame for generating their meaning, right? It's not just the reality or the facts it's also how people tend to interpret this reality or these facts that's why this course tended to be very much important for us right so and the puzzle i briefly reflected upon the puzzle right so most of the structural factors that we've dwelled in were scrutinized within the context of personal experience and exposure to violent conflict right so this means that most of the research which tended to employ these structural factors stem from the idea that a lot of people both directly or indirectly you know experience destruction hurt trauma during the last war right and then you know this was our puzzle so what happens with uh, the explanatory potential of these structural factors right when you put them within the context of warless societies so societies which manage to you know prevent war or societies that didn't experience hurt destruction trauma as you know, it was the case of uh, Balvine, right? And then we try to understand, can they be of use to understand, you know? So if they tend to explain how war occurred, can they explain why war didn't occur or war, you know, couldn't occur, right? And that's where, you know, we came to, to the Balvine uh, example. And when we try to situate the, the Balvine as a village, you know, that managed to, to prevent the war. I'm just showing you the conceptual framework. It looks 
rather complex, but the idea is that we tend to use the structural factors, as I already said, through, you know, three conceptual frameworks. So the first one being the inter-ethnic violence, right? And then the second and the third one focusing on the peaceful societies and non-war communities. We tended to make sense, you know, of the structural factors that explain inter-ethnic violence and trying to appropriate them within, you know, peaceful societies and non-war communities. So here you have, for example, rather complex picture, but to a certain extent, we tended to understand the elements how one society can remain peaceful, right? So here you have some pictures of this ethnically mixed village. So maybe just a few sentences from Balvina. So Balvina is located approximately 15 kilometers from Mrkonićgrad. I don't know if most of you know where is Mrkonićgrad, but it was very infamous also during the Bosnian War. So you had uh, paramilitary units there, so Arkanovi Tigrovi. So here you had, you know, uh, really, really dense, uh, really um, uh, problematic, you know, uh, place where, you know, ethnic cleansing occurred. And then you have village that is located only, you know, 15 kilometers from there and managed you know to to stay peaceful to a certain extent but it's of course a small village which is ethnically mixed consisted of spodnje so upper and lower balvine spodnje idonje balvine so in the um, upper balvine serbs live and then lower balvine where the bosniaks live so during the war there was approximately 1200 um, people villagers living in balvine and the composition ethnicity-wise was rather um, symmetrical. It was 60% against 40% within uh, the Bosnian war, right? So how we approached it, as we said, we tended to understand the perceptions and how people actually perceived that they managed to prevent the war. So we, we tended to use the mixed method design. So it was quantitative and qualitative data. So we actually also relied upon you know the the surveys and questionnaires and then we have this um, qualitative data where we wanted to uh, focus on this um, participatory uh, and informal gatherings participatory with observation and informal uh, talks with the villagers so that was our idea as you said so i was there for four times in balvine um together it was like almost a month in Balvin and talking with the villagers, living with them, for example, for 12, 13 hours, drinking with them, coffee, eating with them. So I tended to understand how they differ, how they understand their, their own position within, within Balvin and how do they reflect upon. And of course, I didn't only manage to talk with the villagers in Balvin, I also talk, I also managed to talk with the officers of Army of Republika Srpska, which was situated in Balvin during the Bosnian War. So I managed to obtain interviews with them, with the commander of chief. He didn't want to meet me in person, but we had it via email. And then to two officers that were there, alongside with the commander of uh, police forces in Mrkonićgrad, we managed to make an interview in uh, Banja Luka. So we also talked about how they perceived their role as an army, right? Because most of the people, when we went there, they said the army officers were, you know, the connectors, they helped us. Um, when we had, for example, some shortages, labor, uh, hospitals, they drove us, no problem. They didn't make problems. They observed that we live in a certain kind of harmony. They didn't want to ignite anything, right? So for that reason, I tended, I also wanted to understand what was the motivation by the officers, right? So because as we also tend to say, the, the macro situation in Bosnia actually allowed for, you know, officers being cruel. Right, so that the war could actually happen. So, what was the motivation in this macro, you know, disorder for the officers to be there and say, "Hey, we are going to preserve the peace." Right, so we are not going to see, search our own, for example, fanatic interests, political interests, whatever. Right, we are going to act as people to people and you know manage to prevent uh, the open uh, scale violence among them. Right, so. In terms of this political institutional factor, so which was one of the five factors, you could sense that they um, tended to display certain asymmetry when it comes to distrusting the political elite. So I'm trying to combine both the quantitative and the qualitative part, right? So you could observe that 
you know, um, Bosniak respondents do not talk much about the current political situation. This is also partly because they live in, in Srpska, right? So, and uh, while Bosnia and Serbs are more engaged within the political everyday, right? So you could observe this local municipal councils. And for example, in this respect, the perceptions of the villagers are more in line with the contours of the political institutional factor epitomizing the post-conflict society. So that was, you know, the quantitative part of observation, even though they managed to prevent the war, right? So they have certain images that display similar parallels that those who would, you know, experience war. So that was, you know, the quantitative part of analysis. So the service among the Serbs and Bosniaks, right? That was, for example, a very interesting and very telling figure. I'm trying to combine also the quantitative part because the article is mostly uh, or exclusively in the qualitative part, right? But within the qualitative part, you could sense that when they reflected upon how they managed to prevent, they say that they had four, you know, um, elders, they say Stareshine. So elders who tended to talk among each other. So two from Bosniak sides and two from Serb side, right? And they said, you're going to, you know, uh, have your dogs on lenses and we are also going to do this so whatever we you know uh, discuss and whatever conclusion we make that's it and they stick to that so they self-organized they understood that the elders are important in Balvina and they managed to talk day on day basis how are they going to arrange everyday life so where is going to be the hospital uh, what is about the car the gas how are they going to focus upon this everyday reality of course um, labor um, birds right so along of these factors you could sense that of course the villagers were to a certain extent did did have this hierarchy and of course when it comes to this political institutional factor one could also reflect upon the idea that Balvina was rather irrelevant for you know the broader idea of Bosnian war because you know uh, the operation ended in 1992 so operation Verbas and then Balvina was you know left alone within this strategic uh, line right so that was also an important uh, element of it and you here you could sense you know this individual um, importance importance of individuals for example when the officer and the commander-in-chief talked to me in, within Banja Luka they said to me look we were tired of war so I had a daughter she had five years I haven't seen her so when I left she was like one year whenever I came into the village when I saw you know uh a young girl, a small girl, I was just thinking about my girl. I just wanted this to end, you know? And he said, I'm a maths teacher. And as maths teacher, I tend to, to think rationally and logically. If nobody is calling me to, to act within something, then I'm going to have this autonomy. And my autonomy was, you know, to talk with the villagers to find, you know, this day-to-day -day situation. Because he said, for example, the villagers didn't reflect upon certain elements. And the of a police officer says, so when he came within the Balvina, he saw the barricades. So after the war, immediately after the war, villagers, you know, had these barricades trying to demark where Serbs and Bosniaks live. And when he came inside, he said, why the barricades? So why do you have them? And they said, you know, people are coming from outsiders from the village are coming the mujahideens are coming you know the chetniks are coming so we are scared right so we are scared and then he said that was my personal mission for one week i came there for every day at four o'clock because i arranged with them if you're going to see mujahideen i'm going to hear every day and chetniks and you must say to me where did you see them how did he you know uh, behave things like that and he said for every day for one week i came there at four talking with the elders and said, okay, did you see Mujahideen? No. Did you see the Chetnik? No. So every day for seven days, you know, he was there asking that questions. And then, you know, he says that to a certain extent, they also seen that this is just, you know, certain propaganda, certain disinformation, certain, you know, provocation from the outsiders to ignite something, right? So here you could observe, you know, the agency of, you know, uh, the people that have, or had, you know, political power, social power, cultural power to ignite something or to prevent something. So here was really important who was, you know, the officer and who was the commander uh, in chief of the police um, station, right? In terms of the socioeconomic factor, which is the second uh, 
element scrutinized. You could show that, you know, the statistical results show that they had very little control over the economic situation. And they also perceive that they have and still have uh, similar economic opportunities. This is really important because in most of other cases, they also tended to, ex to explore the idea that they didn't have the same opportunities. And that's why we have to fight, right? That's why we have to resist. And most of the villages in Balvin, not just during the war, but also after the war, are saying that they have similar economic opportunities. They say we are united in poverty. For example, they still don't have, you know, um, water, clean water. They don't have water system. So for 30 years after the war, they still didn't, don't have that. And they say, because we are because we are so positive in Republika Srpska, because our story is so positive, the political elite ignores us, right? So they don't want to promote the story where, you know, Bosniaks and Serbs can get along, that they can be, you know, good neighbors. And they, they feel that they are, you know, to a certain extent neglected and also their story. Um, and of course, they said also during the, and also previous, so before the Bosnian war, they said, we are villagers, you know, we had to, helped each other so you had this generalized reciprocity and solidarity among them and you still see them see this you know that's the idea they didn't feel that you know neighbor has more because he's bosnian or he's serb but they said we don't we have nothing so we together have to do something to have something right and then you have a lot of had a lot of stories from villagers his son was helping my son his son was helping you know me with the water because we didn't have the clean water you know and then you need to to walk for five kilometers and no matter whether he was Bosnia helping Serb or vice versa, you know, that was something normal. And you could see this uh, generalized reciprocity still today because you have a small shop in Balvine, a really small shop, you know, where local uh, Bosniaks and Serbs eat together, drink together, talk together, you know, in a mixed, you know, um, community. And also when you sense it via Facebook, because of course they also have Facebook, you, you could see, you know, that the Serbs something right. And then the Bosniaks comments, oh, oh neighbor, come to me, you know, uh, what you need, whatever you need, I'm here. So you could see, you know, this perception of they being, you know, um, that ethnicity doesn't matter for them, that they are, you know, true, genuine friends and true, genuine, you know, family to a certain extent. So this factor was clearly one of the most important, right? And they were always talking about, you know, this uh, socialized concept of dost. So this is a Turkish word and it means a friend. So whenever he went, for example, uh, traveling to Yaitse or to Banja Luka, he didn't, uh, when he returned to Balvina, he didn't go home at first, but he went to his friend. So as a Bosniak, you would go to your first closest Serb friend to eat something, drink something, and then return back. So they were all talking about this concept of dost, that we can rely in each other, right? So in this socioeconomic sense, you could see that the results more fit the conceptual contours of peaceful societies, where, you know, this generalized reciprocity, as I said, was one of the most important right and when you come to this spatial strategic factor right so you could observe that um the impression was that the inter-ethnic entity line right so demarking the federation of Bih and srpska or the idea of you know republika srpska being a subnational political entity with high autonomy is a given reality right so it was relatively irrelevant for them so they didn't talk about srpska they didn't talk about federation they didn't talk about bosnia they were just talking about Balvine. So you could observe that, that they didn't, you know, fit in within this predominant ethno-political narrative that is trying to be installed both from Sarajevo and from Banja Luka, right? So this is something that was really important for them, right? And of course, isolation, as I said, was factor, right? Because Balvine were isolated enough not to be cleansed, right? And officer also said that to me. So when I asked him, okay, but then the higher officers, commanders, you know, of army, did they call you? And he said, no. So nobody called me, right? So, and because nobody called me, I was left on my own. So to do what I think is right, right? And the right thing to do for him was, you know, to, to manage the situation in preventing the violence, right? And of course, um, they also said that they didn't feel pressure to provoke any situation, right? So they've seen some tensions, but they were doing everything, you know, to omit this provocation. Most of them saying that there were a lot of outsiders, you know, during 1992, a lot of outsiders, a lot of outside villagers came to Balvine trying to sell arms, trying to sell guns, trying to sell 
uh, stuff and the officer said that we tended to to um, prevent that that there were you know to a certain extent you had houses full of guns he said that to me so what he did so he was just trying to you know prevent this and taking the guns both from bosniaks and serbs and most of bosniaks when you talk to them they said yeah it's it's true we had a lot of guns and they also had a lot of guns nothing happened but we had them and then the officers took all of our guns so he didn't you know perceive us as bosniaks and him being as a serb or vice versa so all of them you know were taking the guns so you could again see here the autonomous agency and the importance of individuals, you know, during this macro scale of uh, violence that uh, happened. Uh, the historical factors for, for me, probably one of the most important one, because it fits within the all other factors. It's the, about the perception, right? So the first thing when we came to the village, the Bosniak, uh, the Bosniak interviewee, one of the oldest one, he's 83. He said, look, I know the stories. During the Second World War, we and my grandpa and my father, they were protecting the local Serbs against Ustasha. And then during the Bosnian Wars, the Serbs defended us against the army of Republika Srpska or paramilitary units. So you could see here that they didn't have a history of violence, which is really important during these post-conflict societies. So you had this idea. They were protecting us during the Second World War. They've seen us, you know, as our neighbors and friends and something worth dying also for, you know. Of course, when you, when you resist, you also can die, right, to a certain extent. And the same then apply to them. So you could see that, you know, institution of komšilu or neighborliness, as we say in English, right, present both before and uh, during the war, right? And here you could observe this really shared historical narrative and inter-ethnic reciprocity, right? So this is something that was really, you know, um, relevant. So we, we talked for six months or seven months, we talked with all the local historians, you know, because you don't have the, the literature on Balvin is scarce, you know, it's, they, we talked with the people in the archives, people focusing on the Second World War and everything and they said, and they just sent us three, three books. So you have three books which briefly reflect upon Balvin, that it was a partisan stop and things like that. So you could see how, you know, in the process of in the absence of facts and in the absence of, you know, historical narratives that are, you know, within the literature, you could just rely on the perception of the villagers. So that's why I was always talking about it's about the facts, but it's also about how people see the facts, interpret the facts and believe. And they do believe that it was like that. I cannot confirm nor deny that because we don't have, you know, the information because we didn't, you know, establish that this is a historical fact, but they believe it. All of them believe it, which is really, which is really, you know, um, important and was important during that because all of them, so both Serbs and Bosniaks, that was the first sentence when we came, you know, we didn't fight. We don't have history of violence. They protected us, so we protected them. It was the same story, the same imaginary, the same idea. And the cultural factor, this is where it gets to a certain extent complex. So... The statistical analysis um, shows that, you know, they, they are not concerned with the state, the relations in the village. They are more concerned with the nature of relations on the state level, right? They don't have any problem with having a member of other ethnic group as a friend, neighbor, co-worker, or boss. However, however, they have big shared problem with inter-ethnic marriages in the village. So we had a lot of um, villagers talking us from one situation. So you had, you had this Elma and Gavro um, story. So he was a Serb coming back to the village, served you know, the Yugoslav army and he fell in love with uh, Elma, right? And he was you know, trying to, to have you know, some relationship with her. And then she went to, his to her father saying to him, hey father, you know, Gavro is uh, trying to have a relationship with me and things like that, right? And then the father of Elma went to the father of Gavro saying to him, hey, you know, Gavro, you know, your son, he's trying to, to be romantic with Elma. And you know, what was the decision of the Gavro's father? He expelled him. So he expelled him from the village. It was, you know, shame for them. You don't marry your family. That's the narrative there. So you don't marry the family. And this is something, you know, that is really staying in my mind because they said a lot of people in villagers in Balvina were are inter-ethnically married, but not from people in Balvina. So 
They can be from Mrkonjgrad, Banja Luka, Jajce, whatever, but not in Balmina. So that was something, you know, and when I tried to dig and they, and that was everything. So the answer was always, you don't marry your family, right? So whatever we think about that, that's, that's their, you know, idea, that's their uh, state of the game and they function as that. So that's it. So they drew the line here. We can, we can be everything, but you don't marry from a Bosnia girl to a Serb boy in Upper Balvine or vice versa. You don't do that. And they don't have any, you know, um, I, any example of such inter-ethnic marriage, which is also something that we could reflect. Maybe that was also, you know, a part of this whole mosaic of peace, right? Maybe that line wasn't meant to be, you know, uh, pushed that line was something that you know managed also to preserve maybe this good neighborly relations as well i don't know so here you have you know this idea of peace mosaic we tended to you know have something very nice because you have this a lot of coincidences so we are always i was always when i sat you know with juti he's the owner of you know the the local shop and i said to him okay but what if you know the officer was not, you know, as it was. What if, you know, you weren't as that wife, local imam wasn't like that. So, and he said, sometimes it's about the coincidence and sometimes it's about also a flock. And, and he was right, you know, because it's always a coincidence that has to align. Also, when you're trying to, you know, have projects, you, have, you need to have certain luck. Of course, you have to have the qual quality, you know, material, but it also you have to have certain luck. So that's why we are talking about peace mosaic, right? Maybe it's coincidence. Of course it is, maybe it's not, but it's a compendium. So what if you would take the generalized reciprocity as you hear, you know, trust allow them to develop common strategies for maintaining peace. What if the reciprocity was not there, right? Would it be different? History as a strategic connector, right? So what if, for example, three of them believe that, you know, Bosniaks helped Ustasha during the Second World War in, you know, um, killing the, the local Serbs, right? So that's why we are talking about, you know, the, the peace mosaic, right? So it's a compendium of smaller, smaller pieces that, you know, bring together this um, village of Balmine. So officers did not feel pressure from above to utilize violence for achieving strategic goals. They did what they think or believed it was relevant. Isolation, you know, strategic line, Banja Luka, Jajce, which connects central and northern Bosnia and Herzegovina was already, let's say, solved, right? During the Operation Verbas. So it was isolated, no strategic goals. You had, you know, let's say black hole. We could say black hole. But of course, this black hole could go both ways. You know, it could be massive violence or nothing, right? And here it was to a certain extent, nothing, right? And of course, um, officers have had no motivation, right? They were keen to maintain pre-war uh, peace, right? So that is why I'm always emphasizing the, the role of individuals, right? So how individuals actually matter. And that's something that in literature you tend to, you know, um, not, not see it because we are focused more on this macro structural factors, you know, statistics, quantitative things. And of course, the role of individual is not here, right? And this is something that we have to highlight. We have to research more, right? So how people make peace, right? So not just the, you know, the states, the armies, but people, right? People who, who resist or who, you know, manage to, to resist in this local micro perspective from, from micro practices, right? So that was some kind of our idea and we, we tended to you know not just show the positive story about uh, Balvina and Bosnia and Herzegovina because as you've seen now with the resolution of Srebrenica and then the uh, idea of Dodik trying to secede normally you know this story is ever important because you know the political elites tend to portray that they cannot live together Bosniaks and Serbs and Croats so this is an empirical example that they can still are you know living as normal people, as everywhere in the world, right? But it's also about, you know, rethinking the structural factors within the peace building 
um, things. So that's why I'm also now focused on the ERC. I got a complementary scheme and I'm going to, you know, push more within the structural factors where I'm going to focus on the resistance in Bosnia and in uh, Kosovo, right? And I, I'm tending to understand, you know, what changes from the micro perspective, because I've seen from the case of Balvin that micro perspective really matters. It's not always about the large scale, you know, challenges, large scale issues it's about, you know, the smaller communities that matter and smaller communities that can push some things within the macro level. Okay, not to be too long, I've taken 30 minutes. Um, I would really like to jump into uh, questions, comments, discussion. Thank you so much, Valentina, again, for having me here. And thank you, Tina, for moderating. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Fides. This is fascinating, I must say. Uh, and as you know, I am involved in the same <laughs> topic. I have been working on other communities and I see a lot of commonalities and some differences. And of course, I have tons of questions, but I will jump in later. So if you maybe can remove the, uh, the, the, the presentation so we see colleagues better and we will open the floor uh, now for, for any questions uh, from, the, from the group. Colleagues, the floor is yours. I do not see any hands yet. I'm sure, of course, there's Jane. Hello, Jane, great to great to see you. Uh, maybe you can say a few words on, on who you are. And uh, we, we, we do know each other, but other yeah. colleagues don't know you. And then you can jump in with your question, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Faris and Valentina. Um, absolutely fascinating. So yes, Valentina and I have been in contact. I'm doing a PhD on Tesla. Um, so, of course, very, very interested in, in everything that, that you've said. Um, I mean, I, 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 a zillion questions, but I'm really interested in this concept of the uh, individual initiative of the officers. Um, and apologies, I didn't catch whether that was a, a police officer or a member of the army or the territorial defence. So I wonder if you could just expand on that. But also, I mean, I, I haven't come across this in in the Bosnian context, I've come across it in the concept of uh, of, of um, the Holocaust that that there were no Nazis that were persecuted because they decided they didn't want to carry out their orders. But I've not come across it in this context, and I, I'm staggered that even though one individual chose to to not carry out violence, that that nobody else jumped in. I don't know if you can say any more. How how did nobody else just say, well, you know, we're going to do it anyway, even if if this particular officer doesn't want to. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much, Jane, for this. Um, I was also, you know, really that was that was the idea. So when first we, I talked to the villager for two or three times. They were always saying the officers were nice. So, and there were three officers. So the commander in chief and two officers, they were always saying they were nice, but I didn't understand what this nice means, you know, as you said. So I tried to, you know, dig in and found the, the names of the commander of chief. And then he said to me, you know, this was Peter Juricic and, you know, somebody else being there. So, and I started to type to them. So how how was it possible that he prevented a war? And he started, you know, this politically, commander in chief. You know, we are army. We are. We have to protect the civilians. We have to protect the citizens. That is not a role of army, you know, to ignite violence. The role of army is to protect the civilians. Right. So you've seen this political speech from the commander of chief. But then, I've, when I've talked to the officers, so one of them, one of two, uh, two, one of out of the two. So Peter Juricic, he is a maths teacher and he's actually said, yeah, of course we can talk about it. This is, I have really nice memories. I wanted to have a conversation with Imam. I want to go with you in Balvina. So uh, that's something that I'm still going to have to do with him because he's, and he said, in, he, and we sit it in Banja Luka and then he's called his friend who was commanding officer of police during the times. So we sat for five hours, you know, talking about the situation. And he said, you know, look, I was a, a reservist, so I was a reserve. Third or fourth wave, I was called. I was a maths teacher before, working in Croatia. So, and then he said, okay, so I was, you know, called within the army of Republika Srpska, and then I just came there. And I said, I always tended to portray logically and deductively as a maths teacher. You know, I tended to make out of a sense, you know, rationality. And I said to him, okay, but... Okay, you were like that. That's some personal traits that, you know, shine when you don't have, you know, orders. And he said, there were no orders for us. 
So we were just, you know, po posted there, you know, you have to be here. You have to, they say, držati liniu. So they have to protect, you know, the line and that's it. So the line was ignited during the operation of Furbas and they were left alone, as you said. This is really interesting because, you know, if you don't have orders, you know, directly from the higher levels, then you could also do, you know, whatever you want, of course. And the macro context, as you said, you know, allow that, allow the massacres, allow the cleansing, allow whatever you want, whatever you wish during this disorder. And he said, I didn't want that because when I've came to, to the village, I've sensed some good energy. I mean, I don't know if this is, you know, a reflection, romanticized reflection, but he said, I sense some good energy. I've seen a local Bosniak drinking with his local Serb, you know, three months after the operation Vervas, and I was like thinking, okay, so they're good. They get along with each other. So we have to protect that. We have to protect that. And he said, I've seen a lot of suffering during the war. I've not, I didn't see my daughter, you know, for three years already. And I just wanted this to end. So that was, you know, her, his personal situation. So I wanted to be rational. I've seen that they don't want to fight each other. So I just have to, you know, we had certain smaller provocations, but I have to do something, you know, to, to, to deprovoke the situation. And that's why I'm telling you. So for seven days, he came at four to the elders talking. Did you see Mujahideen? No. Did you see, you know, the Chetnik? No. So that was his logic. And he said that, you know, the commanding officers, the commanding officers, Lazo Babic that time, he was, you know, wounded. That's why he came to Balvine, right? So it was also, as we say, strategically irrelevant. They didn't care to a certain extent. So those who were, you know, second or third, you know, uh, great or rated, you know, officers came there. So that was also probably important because they were less inclined towards violence. They were, you know, professionals having their own careers. Before the army, they were not professional officers. So that's also something important. But of course, the police officer, the commander of chief of police, was he was really interesting and he was really an open book. So after the war, so after the Bosnian war, he went to Sarajevo to work because his his uh, wife is a Bosniak. So that's also important to reflect upon. So he actually had this interethnic, you know, uh, mixed marriage. Uh, and of course, he understood that um, he has to also to protect his Bosnian friends. And he also said to me, so uh, it was he was and this was probably one of the, the wickedest stories that he told me. So as I said, the paramilitary officers were there. Arkan was there for three times. So he talked, he spoke, he drank, you know, beer with Arkan. And he had his friend Ahmed. So Ahmed was a friend of his living in Mrkonićgrad. And of course, he was always calling this Peter, so Peter Schumann, he was always calling to him, is it safe to go outside? So are there any Tigrotsis? So are there any paramilitary officers? And one time when he called, you know, and this was something we could Arkan answered because he was with him that time. And he sensed that it was not the voice of Peter. And then Arkan allegedly, so I'm telling you a story that Peter said to me, Arkan said, who is this? Koeto. And he said, Atso. So he was Ahmo. But he said Atso because he understood that the voice was not of his friend. And then he, you know, tried to, you know, um, change the situation uh, to, you know, make it uh, worth. And then he said, five years after the war, we, you know, uh, again, seen each other in Sarajevo. And he said to him, do you know who was on the phone when, you know, you, you answered? And he said, no. And he said, Arkan. And he said that his face went white. So... So you could sense the trauma inside of him. And, you know, this was something. And then the second story that the commanding officer said to me was that Tigrozi were drunk at 1.30 in the morning. And then, you know, he they sit with him in some bar and said to him, okay, where are the Bosniak houses? We want to sleep somewhere, right? So we are drunk. We need to sleep somewhere. And of course, it's Bosniak houses. And the commanding officer said, I've called 43 policemen, 43 policemen from all around Mrkonićgrad to come immediately to Mrkonićgrad and drive all the Tigrovci within the Republika Srpska, so during that night. So, and a police officers, 43 of them came with their cars and then they went, so from wherever villages to their homes. And that's how he also said that he potentially prevented some further 
massacres in Marikonic Grad because, you know, he could say, yeah, there are six houses. It's easy, right? It's easy. But then he took the, you know, the, the longer way and the tougher way. And that was something fascinating for me, you know? I don't know if it's true. Maybe he's telling that, you know, with the reflection of 25 years, of course, he wanted to, you know, uh, cover the, the idea. But, you know, everything that happened during the times in, in Balvin and this, you know, confirmed this kind of stories that they actually had. The people who held, you know, political, military, as you said, police power, they actually tended to prevent everything. And they also said, nobody called us. Nobody said, hey, we have to ethnic cleanse. We have to, you know, uh, do this and that. So, but of course, as you said, they could do the opposite. They could, yeah. they could do it. And it's a fascinating story. And you could do, you know, uh, as you said, some theory or further conceptual framework. That is something I've also sent you uh, the, the paper uh, that was published. So Balvina, you could also see here, maybe you could get, you know, some uh, ideas for further research or you could also appropriate it for, for Tuzla, right? Because Tuzla is, of course, as you said, some city that also managed to, you know, prevent certain atrocities. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, Paris. Fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Faris. And colleagues, you will see in the chat, if you haven't, uh, Faris has pasted, uh, this is the recent paper published uh, a month ago, I think a little bit uh, uh, around that. So there is the article on Balvina with more information. But I'm also sure you have more questions. Uh, and let's take the opportunity of having Faris uh, here. Anybody else would like to, to come in? Yes, uh, Joe, please. Hello, uh, thank you, Faris, for this really engaging presentation and story as well. Um, and I'm really struck by the element of historical memory. I think that's really important. Um, and, you know, you particularly mentioned uh, memory of World War II, you know, which is hard for you to confirm, but at least it's something that the villagers believe in and accept. Uh, but there's another period of history that I'm curious about, and that's the Yugoslav socialist period. Uh, so I wonder if you were able to discern uh, any impacts from that period on on how the um, events proceeded, and also if there's elements of maybe Yugo nostalgia among the villagers or something like that. Because um, I think it, you know, it could have some historic, some pretty big historical conclusions about the Yugoslav project in rural areas, but also um, the impacts of Yugo nostalgia and, and, and things like that. So hmm. thank you so much, Joe, for, for the question. So that's really interesting. I didn't perceive Balvina through this uh, conceptual framework of Yugo nostalgia, but you could you could sense the the bond, you know, you could sense the also the the uh, music that they were listening. So they were gathered and they were listening to ex Rock. So I, I don't say that this is some kind of a nostalgia, but you, you could sense that their every day is based on this, you know, Yugoslav past, right? So they are like a postcard of what Yugoslavia or Yugoslav socialism tended to portray, you know, being together, drinking together, you know, laughing together, crying together. So yes, they didn't talk about Yugoslavia much. So they didn't talk about the situation before the war. So, you know, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, they always tended to portray that they had nothing. So that they had to rely upon each other. So they were always emphasizing we couldn't survive without each other. So, um, and, you know, the local shop owner, Juti, so that was, that's his, you know, um, surname. I mean, that's how they call him. Yeah. Um, he said that, you know, before the war and during the war, there were all, all just two people employed, the imam local and him. And then after the war, they all have employments, just the imam and him are left unemployed. So that's also the idea that you could sense, you know, who had the power religious, you know, religious um, owners and then the shop owner. So you had local pop and imam who were quite influential within the community. They didn't have any, you know, uh, pretensions of being, you know, violent or being, you know, provocative. And then the local shop owner, you know, who to a certain extent also ignited this reciprocity because he said, you know, they didn't pay full prices. Sometimes they, they, they paid, you know, six months after that. So you could see you know, that even though the economy, you know, the, the economic factor um, functions, um, it didn't. So they, they had their own, you know, micro bubble within which they live. So I would say that if you look at them, it's, you know, postcard of what Yugoslavia tended to be or tended to be portrayed. But I don't, uh, when we were talking, I didn't sense that. So they didn't, you know, 
say anything about Yugoslavia. They sometimes they reverted to Tito, so they said, yeah, it were they were good times. You know, but you know, as you said, probably because you're a scholar of Yugoslav nostalgia, it's maybe not being nostalgic per se, but what is missing, right? So Yugoslav nostalgia is maybe what something is missing right now, right? And maybe that's also to a certain extent right for them because you know, currently 130 people live in Balvine. That's it. So you know, after the war, 1,000 people uh, went, fled Balvine, and you know, you have certain proportions, 60 Serbs and 80 Bosniaks, they have still school, but the problem with the school, so for example, a teacher said to us, because they have teacher from coming, you know, from, from uh, Mrkonigrad, and she said that now it's a problem because she has just three students, and all of them are Bosniaks, and that's a problem, and she's a Bosniak, for example, she's a Bosniak, said, that's a problem, I don't want to teach here anymore, because I don't see you know, something that is from Balvin or something that was always present in Balvin and Bosniaks and Serbs being together. And for example, the local imam now, he's 27 years old. So he's very young. And, you know, when I asked him, so you started in Sarajevo, why Balvin? And he said to me, because I've sent something here. They don't have water. They don't have, you know, uh, good conditions, but I've seen something in that people. And for example, he says to me, you know, when I talked to him with, uh, within this uh, paradigm of Latin uh, Cyrillic, right? He said to me, Cyrillic is Bosnian. So I just speak, I just write Cyrillic. So, and he's a Bosniak. So you see local imam using Cyrillic, not just that. So stating and arguing that that's true, genuine Bosnian, you know, uh, alphabet. And you have a lot of this, you know, uh, wicked uh, situations that, you know, debunk everything that we know about Bosnia. And that's maybe, that's maybe something that was, for me, the, you know, the most positive part, or at least a personal experience, you know, because I was focused so much on Srpska and so much upon the problems that I've, you know, missed the gems. And Balvina is probably one of the gems. And if you have one gem, then, you know, um, this is something that you, you can push further the agenda i don't know if i answered joe anything but you know um just trying oh you did that's great thank you thank you thanks uh, thanks joe uh, any more questions uh, colleagues thoughts comments for paris while we wait for others I, I will come in with with a few of mine which which build on what you have just said uh, Faris, uh, I'll go with two questions if you don't mind. So what you have been describing, actually, it seems to me, is kind of a very uh, specific local group identity, uh, uh, basically. I will, you're there, no? Mm -hmm. uh, because you're saying it's wicked, it's different. I mean, it's it's wicked and different from what we are used to in terms of thinking of group identities in terms of ethnic group identities. And I think you 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 alluded to some of the values. Uh, so I wanted to ask you first of all how how strongly do people uh, identify themselves with being from Balvine? Uh, how 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 important it is uh, to them? How salient is if you want that local group identity? And if I mean, what what are the values and norms uh, behind? You alluded to some, but I think it's it's maybe worth trying to to capture them uh, in 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 one uh, answer. And then I have a second uh, question for you, uh, quite different, if you don't mind. And that's coming back to your to your first slides where you were thinking of of okay, how can we now rescue and use these examples? And I'm wondering the same. So I'm asking you here, is I mean. Nobody knows about these examples, if, except a few scholars who hear uh, here and there, uh, and they are such a gems, as you say, such, they have such a value and they challenge so many assumptions about what happened in Bosnia and what is the current situation and what can, so have you come up with some, some sort of uh, ideas of what are the ways, the avenues of of preserving and and kind of, uh, you know, instrumentalizing also these experiences, but instrumentalizing them for good? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Valentina, so much for this. So with the first question, completely agree. They they don't say that they are Bosnian, Bosniak, Serb. They said we are Balvanci, so Balvanian. So they have this regional identity. They don't care about the 
ethnic identities, they don't care about the national state affiliations, they perceive themselves as different. Probably it's just as you know, the regional identity, and it's usually, you know, much more easier to identify with that if the stories are, you know, more positive. And that's something that also makes them different from the others, right? And um, I would say that the values and the norms, as I observed within the villagers, are, you know, this reciprocity, it's really, and solidarity, you know, and, but having, you know, a straight idea of what is permitted and what is not permitted, right? So they have a still at a really strong etiquette. So how and protocol, how to, you know, uh, function within the, the story. So for example, I didn't mention the role of women, which is really important. For example, when you come to the local shop, there are just men. So you don't have this, you know, the idea of uh, coffee, right? The gender of coffee, as some scholars tended to, to perceive. You don't have a Bosniak women and Serbian women drinking coffee together. That's also to a certain extent really telling. So you could see that here is, you know, this male dominated perception that everything is okay because we hang, but we don't have the women, you know, that come to each other at coffee, uh, talking with each other. So that's that's really, really interesting. I would say that it's really male-centric, male-oriented society, very collectivist, with strong protocol of how to behave and how is not how not to behave. But in, in terms of the identity is more regional one or more, you know, village one. It's I didn't heard anyone talking about, you know, being uh, Bosnian, Bosniak. So also in terms of the surveys, they tended to they tended to uh click the other so other and then writing balvansi so the, the from villagers from balvine i don't know if i answered it uh, and and the second one i am just think i'm always thinking about that so that's my you know how to make this uh, more uh, mainstream i i don't like the mainstream word but in this respect we have to mainstream this so i have a lot of a lot of you know um People contacted me, reporters. So reporters also had, you know, a strong role in that. So when we started to do this and after this, a lot of reporters with which I usually uh, collaborate with were very prone towards, you know, pushing that story in the media landscape. I don't know regarding the reaction of it, but it's out there now. So the media part is fine. I'm now talking uh, with the filmers. So a lot of people wanted to do documentaries. I'm, all, I'm currently helping one Bosnian uh, filmmaker from Mostar. He wants to apply for the funds and make you know, a documentary on Balvine because he was so fascinated with it. And he says that has to go out. You know, This is something that has to be out there. And of course, the third way, what I'm thinking about now is some, you know, NGO projects. So we have to gather the stories. So we have Tzerf, we have, you know, or Erasmus or something like that. We need to have another, you know, block of participants, practitioners from peace building or people that, you know, know have the know-how, how to do the projects, how to upscale them, because we don't do that or we don't you know, we don't have the know-how how to do that we need you know practitioners people from ngo sectors civil society actors that could maybe help us frame and further this story right so that for example the story of balvin and not just balvin a kamenica as well in kosovo or gorski kotar in croatia this is something that kids have to study or learn maybe that's also something that has to be within the the primary school the secondary school so this is you know the third avenue that i'm currently exploring i was more focused within the application of the second project but probably in the following months i've already talked with some people in sarajevo in banja luka uh, i'm uh, and they are more than open to maybe apply something within that so the positive peace agenda right so the positive peace uh, uh reconciliation and things like that so that they could start talking about about Bali. so the these three avenues i've seen i don't know if this will function but we are now in the process of trying to make it function. I know that uh, we are, you know, scholars, but um, I always say we are also, you know, active citizens. And this is something that has to be uh, out there because it's positive and it's, as you said, it debunks so many assumptions on Bosnia, on, on post-conflict societies, right? On this hatred, antagonisms, things like that. So politicians instrumentalize the situation. So people are trapped within the antagonisms, not because they are such per se. So that's something that I've 
come around within the last two, three years when I'm starting <clears throat> to ask these different types of questions. Because before that, I was just asking, why don't you get along, right? And now I'm asking, how do you get along? What is the recipe, right? So maybe that's also part of my, you know, learning. Thank you so much, Faris. Thanks. Uh, I, I I definitely would like to yeah get together as well to to brainstorm on that. I do have some also additional ideas. I think maybe connecting those communities is another way. And um, I I think yeah we we have to put our minds together. Uh, but colleagues also feel free to jump in with with some suggestions or with any additional questions you would have for for Faris. Ilona, I think I see you putting your camera. Would you like to come in with any questions? No. Anyone else, your last chance for the moment, otherwise we'll start closing. No. Okay, then I think, uh, thank you very much. Thank you all for being uh, with us uh, here. Uh, thank you, Tina, uh, for organizing uh, this call and warmest thanks to you, uh, Faris, for sharing with us uh, your your experience uh, in Baliwin and for continuing uh, to push for, for more of those communities to to emerge and to, to, to be known uh, to the broader uh, public. Uh, back to you then, Tina, for the, for the closure. Thank you very much for being here and uh, thank you Paris once again and see you next Thursday. Thank you. Thank you so much. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye everyone.